I mean, this is an idea that was that was not supposed to work because if, if you put it on a spreadsheet and you calculated it up, there were too many forces working against this. If anything, just the bias that we're all taught as kids that strangers equal danger. Like we had that to go up against, which is like, how do you even overcome that? Today, we're talking to one of the most interesting entrepreneurs on the planet, and I'm not saying this lightly, Airbnb co-founder, Joe Jebbia. Now, after moving to San Francisco in October 2007, Joe and his roommate, Brian Chesky, came up with the idea of putting a mattress in their living room and turning it into a bed and breakfast. Today, Airbnb is now one of the most recognized brands on the planet with a valuation at around $75 billion. You're going to hear some truly incredible stories today from someone who had an idea that has literally changed the world. So if you're ready to learn what it takes to turn your idea into a billion dollar reality, this interview is for you. Please welcome to the Founder Podcast, Joe Jebbia. The first question we ask everyone that comes on is, uh, how did you get your job, aka how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? <laughs> That's such a funny question to ask. I think any entrepreneur will probably give you the same answer. Many of your guests have probably said the same thing. We made our own jobs. You know, there was no job description, there was no application process, there was nobody to work for because the company didn't exist. And that is absolutely the case with, with Airbnb. Uh, you know, since I was in high school, uh, during the first dot com, I would come home every day and I'd read these stories about these companies launching in this mythical place called Silicon Valley. And I grew up in, in Georgia, in the southern part of the United States. And every day there was a new story about a new company and this place of San Francisco, Silicon Valley, left this imprint on me. And I remember saying to myself, I know I want to start a company one day. It sure seems like Silicon Valley is the place to do it. Uh, and so I, 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 I knew in high school at some point I was going to make my way to the West Coast. And when I finally did get out there in 2006, the timing couldn't have been better. It was sort of the second coming of the Internet. You know, the first dot com crash happened. There was a bit of a lull. And around 2006, things started to pick back up again. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of activity uh, with startups. Um, in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. You know, YouTube had just been acquired by Google. I think that was really like um, kind of the, the gun went off that there was a, a resurgence in the internet of uh, a new way of thinking about how to build and grow companies uh, online. Yeah, interesting. So when did you get to, well, yeah, actually I know the answer, but I'd love to hear, even if winding back before Y Combinator, how did you meet Brian? How, how did that all come about? How did you guys decide that you're going to start working on a business together? <laughs> Brian and I, we were classmates together at the Rhode Island School of Design. We were both studying industrial design or product design. And, you know, in high school, I had this, this notion that I want to start a company one day. So when I got to college, my radar was always on. I was always scanning, kind of looking for, for people, friends, to see who, who would be somebody that would be really fun to start a company with one day. And Brian was at the top. We had worked on a project together uh, one summer. And out of all the students that worked on the project, him and I got paired up. And we had by far the most interesting outcome. Uh, the design work we did was just so far afield from everybody else. And I remember thinking to myself, Brian and I are in the same room. We can really think of big ideas together. And so over dinner, uh, we're about to graduate the next day. He's going to go to Los Angeles. I was going to stay in Providence. And I told him, I said, Brian, I have a premonition. I think that one day you and I are going to start a company together and they're going to write a book about it. <laughs> and we both had a good laugh. Um, and little did we know that that would actually become true. In fact, I haven't been, just one book. There's actually been two books uh, about, about the company. Um, so I moved to San Francisco 2006. I saw that it was truly uh, the epicenter of entrepreneurship. So I started calling Brian immediately. I said, hey, I don't know what's going on in Los Angeles, but you, you got to come to San Francisco because this is where the action is. 
and he saw a couple of couple of startups that I was working on out of my apartment, and I think he got the bug. And he saw that like, wow, there's a lot of energy up there. It'd be exciting to be paired back together with Joe and actually think of something together. And so uh, he eventually decided after about a year of recruiting him, he moved to San Francisco and became my roommate. And it was that infamous weekend where he moves in, a letter shows up for the landlord. It says, dear Joe, your rent is now 25% higher. So we have to figure out how to make ends meet very quickly. Uh, and uh, later that week, I'm in the living room of our apartment. And I glance uh, over the, the edge of my laptop. I was looking at the, the website of a design conference coming to San Francisco that was so big, the hotel sold out. It said it sold out on the, web, the website. And I'm reading this, and I look over the screen of the laptop into the, the vastness of the living room. And I thought, huh. I've got an air bed from college that I used to host people on. What if we inflated that in the living room? And we hosted people who wanted a place to stay for this conference. Emailed Brian, he loved the idea. We made the website, we called it air bed and breakfast, a place to sleep plus breakfast in the morning. And the idea was born. It sounds like you kind of always knew deep down that you were destined for, for more than what you were doing at, at that point in time. How did, how, where did that come from, do you think? That's a really good question. You know, my, my parents planted a seed in me probably when I was really young. They were, uh, you know, they worked independently. They were both independent sales reps and they really charted their own path. Their success was dependent on how hard they worked. Um, you know, their, their paycheck wasn't guaranteed every month. It was based on their capacity and, and ingenuity to grow their their business, their sales business. And so I remember watching them thinking, wow, like how, how cool to be in charge and in control of, of your own destiny, to be able to, to forge your own path. And um, you no, know, I, I saw them on good months when they did well, and I saw them on other months when they didn't do so well. And so I saw, you know, a bit of a range of, you know, it's, it's not easy, uh, the lows are low, but the highs are also really high. And so I think ever since as a kid, I just always wanted to start my own thing. I just always wanted to be in control of my own path. Yeah, no, it is, it is truly exceptional what you know you yourself, the, the team at Airbnb have been able to create. Um, so, if we wind, keep going back in time, uh, you had the air mattress. You got your first first guest. What did that look like from a platform perspective? Like who coded up the site? What did that look like? How did you, like, how did you spread the word? Yeah, wow, we made that first website in less than a week or two. I was doing the front end coding and Brian was doing a little bit of the illustration. And then I, I pulled it together and we published the design. It was a five page website. We were so proud of it. Airbedandbreakfast.com, an 18 character URL. I do not recommend a URL that long. And we, we got the site up, but then we had our next challenge, which is how on earth do people find out about this? This is, there's nobody's coming to our new website. And so we had a, uh, an awareness challenge. It turns out the design conference endorsed our website and emailed it out to a few thousand of the attendees. And we also reached out to all the local design firms in San Francisco, IDEO and Frog and Smart Design, Fuse Project. And we asked their designers to list their places for the conference as well. And then we did something. The night, I remember uh, one night before bed, we emailed a bunch of design blogs about airbandbreakfast.com. And we had never gotten any press before. We had no idea how you would get on a blog. The next morning, it felt like Christmas. We were covered on the top design blogs back in 2007. Swiss Miss, Core 77, uh, uh, joshspear.com, cool hunting. There we were, we, in the headlines, at the top of these blogs. <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. And with that awareness, we had people from around the world start to email us and say, hey, I'm coming to the conference, but I have a place to stay. How do I get one of these three airbeds at the airbed and breakfast? And lo and behold, people started sending us their resumes, design portfolios, their LinkedIn profiles, trying to convince us why they should be one of the first three guests on the air bed and breakfast. Crazy. So how much faith did you have um, 
in the start of, of, of Airbnb, like with this, you know, Airbnb and breakfast idea, like, did you, were you confident that it was going to be the thing that you and Brian were going to do or? We were confident enough. And when I think back to like through the early years and all the rejection and the hardships and the, all the reasons why this should not have worked. I mean, this is an idea that was, that was not supposed to work. Because if, if you put it on a spreadsheet and you calculated it up, uh, there were too many forces working against this. If anything, just the bias that we're all taught as kids, that strangers equal danger. Like we had that to go up against, which is like, how do you even overcome that? Uh, and so, you know, building an online marketplace is, is probably one of the hardest, I'd say, you know, verticals to do on the internet. Um, there's a reason that there's only a couple marketplaces. They usually consolidate. There's usually one big winner at the end because um, <clears throat> they're really hard to get the flywheel going and to get the scale of supply and demand that you need for a marketplace to be, um, you know, to, to basically, the, the metaphor we use, to, to walk into the store and have products on the shelf that people want to buy. You have to have scale for that. Uh, you have to have a lot of products. And so in the early days, it was incredibly um, difficult to convince people to even try this. <laughs> um, but there was uh, something unexpected that was in our favor, which is the timing. Because in 2008, 2009, what was happening globally, economically, that impacted a lot of people and changed people's behaviors was the economic downturn, the, the, the Great Recession. And I think because of that, looking back, I could see how people's behavior shifted where prior to that, they'd say, no, 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 no. I, I'm not interested in having a stranger of my own. Even, I have an extra bedroom, but only for people I know. Now, suddenly there's some economic hardship and people looked at it a little bit differently, uh, a little bit more open-minded. Well, you know, if that could help pay off the mortgage every month, I'll give it a shot. I saw a good coverage in the New York Times or maybe a piece of press that we got that year. And people started to open up and warm to this idea. And when they got to our, our service, when they got to Airbnb.com, they saw that we built tools to make it safe, to make it reliable, uh, to make it more trustworthy than, uh, than before. At what moment did you know that Airbnb was going to take off? Like, was there a particular turning point in time that you can maybe recall mm -hmm. or, or draw from that you could share with us? Yeah, there's, there's a couple moments. Um, I'm going to read you an email that we got um, back in 2009. And uh, this is one of the emails that, that we put on the wall. And this was a moment where I said, okay, we're on something here. It says, hi, Airbnb. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that you literally saved us. My husband and I just married this past May after having lost both our jobs and our investments in the stock market crash last year. We slowly watched our savings dwindle to a point where we didn't have enough to make our payments. At that point, I had recently listed our New York City apartment on your site and was receiving so many requests that we decided to rent out our place and seek low-cost vacation accommodations for ourselves elsewhere. You gave us the ability to keep our home, travel together, and have peace of mind knowing that we're going to make it through this challenging time in our life. Thank you so much. Wow. That was a powerful testimonial we got from an early customer, from an early adopter. Um, and I think, it, again, it just showed us that there's, there's a richness to, to our platform that uh, can really help people. That's, um, that's an incredible story. You talk about the early days. Um, what, did, what did team and office and setup look like? I, let's just go. So you got into Y Combinator. Um, incredible story there around how um, you, know, you met Paul and, and he, you know, told you to go to New York, but yeah, maybe a little bit post, post kind of when you got funded, perhaps your, your first round, what a team office set, set up look like. Yeah. Our first round of financing was in April of 2009. Uh, it was, uh, it was a seed round led by Sequoia Capital with Ron Conway as an angel investor, um, uh, along with uh, Kevin Harris, Keith Raboy and, and Javed Kareem. And, uh, this is about $600,000 or so. And for us, this was it. Like, wow, we had 
been scrapping ourselves off of credit cards and uh, it, we, we bootstrapped until there are no laces left to even pull on. <laughs> and so $600,000 for us was like, oh, oh my God, we can, we can now actually afford to like, hire people, a couple engineers, uh, some, some, uh, some people to just help us grow the team. Nate at this time was doing the work of probably three or four engineers. He was having to build a payment system, a reputation system, a search algorithm, profiles. Uh, and so we needed to hire like five or six people immediately to keep up with this, uh, the numbers that were growing very quickly. So we're still working out of our living room. That was our office for the first uh, two years or so of the company. That's a great way to keep, keep our costs down. Um, and uh, we ended up having, uh, I think we maxed out at about 20 people working out of our three bedroom apartment in San Francisco. And uh, at a certain point, Brian and I actually moved out. Our bedrooms became a meeting room and more desk space. <laughs> uh, it got so crazy. I mean, I can't begin to tell you. People were doing sales calls in the kitchen. People were doing sales calls in the bathroom. There was nowhere to interview anybody because there's no meeting space. People were doing interviews in the stairwell of the apartment building. It was, it was mayhem. <laughs> we, were, we were all sitting on top of each other, elbow to elbow. And, you know, I will say this, the people that joined at that time, um, yeah, they joined for something more than the paycheck because we didn't have a lot to pay. You know, we, we weren't competing with, of course, not with Facebook, or Google, or any of those guys. We were just a couple of guys working out of a, a three-bedroom apartment in San Francisco. And <clears throat> people really joined because they saw that there was something bigger, that there was, there was this potential that we had to use travel to connect people in a way that hadn't been done before. That's awesome. So, look, just switching gears, um, just around bringing your idea to life. Um, for someone that's been like holding on to their idea for a while, or they might feel stuck or not knowing when to start, what would you say to them? I get this question a lot. And I think the simplest thing that your listeners or anyone who has an idea can do is very simply take the next step, figure out what is, what is just the tiniest next step that I need to take to move my idea forward. It doesn't have to be the end goal. It doesn't have to be the big final vision. I think a lot of people get stuck when they think, well, I gotta, I have to do all these things. But if you reduce it down to just like, literally like what's the one tiniest next thing that I can do to move this forward, people usually have an answer to that question. And it's usually not as complicated as, as they made it up in their head. And so I really encourage people to take the next step, whatever that might be for them. It might be sharing your idea with a roommate or a colleague or a friend. And just say, hey, what do you think about this? It might be sending an email to somebody or reaching out over Twitter or posting something on Twitter. It might be just publishing the website, you know? Um, there's, there is a myth I think there's this myth that exists where <clears throat> I, I certainly experienced this as a you know, budding entrepreneur looking up to companies that were established and founders that started those companies thinking, wow, like, you know, they, they just woke up one day and had the idea and it just, just took off just like that. And that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm sure many of your guests have said this. It's like, no, like anybody who's gone through this and, and got something to a level of success has had the, there's a whole you know, path of failures that preceded it. And um, I really encourage people to, to get something out into the world, even if it's not the big idea, because even the small things build on themselves. And you know, I worked on four or five ideas or companies before Airbnb. Most people never heard of them because they never turned into anything, but each one of those things built on top of the one before it. And so by the time Airbnb came around, I was in a much different place and it was just starting from scratch. Said another way, nobody in their right mind would run a marathon without training. Nobody wakes up in the morning and all of a sudden runs 26 and change miles. You have to train for it. And so I encourage people to get in the gym of entrepreneurship and just take the next tiniest next step to bring ideas to life. Yeah, that's, I love that analogy. 
Um, and I love that, yeah, that was spot on. So does an idea need to come to you or can you search for one? Typically have been trying to solve a problem that I've experienced firsthand. And I've been dissatisfied with existing solutions out in the world. I think if people or entrepreneurs chase sort of just a market or an industry or something that's hot at the moment, it's not really the, the intrinsic motivation isn't quite as deep as if you're solving a problem for yourself and you're just completely dissatisfied with everything that's out in the market. That's, that's incredible motivation. Mm. And I'm curious, um, when it comes to kind of ideas and some of the business that you worked on previously, did you have the same amount of confidence that you had with Airbnb or was it because of the traction that gave you just that confidence that it, it would eventually work? Well, I think for me, you know, every time I tried something, it either worked or it didn't. But at the end of the day, I, I learned something and I had more knowledge and more experience than I did before I tried it. And I think all that compounds on itself and you get to a point where, you know, you're less afraid to try something new or you're less afraid to, you know, do something that's a little bit different or people would describe as, well, that's weird, which we certainly heard a lot in the early days at Airbnb. <laughs> people that, that's crazy. No one's ever going to do that. Uh, so look, I, I think um, it's just, a, it's a muscle that anybody can build and develop. You're not born with it. Um, I think it just comes through experience. Yeah, I see. And just one more question on the ideas, then we'll move to work towards wrapping up. Um, I'm curious, when it comes to the other businesses that you worked on, for example, like the cereal box and, and how you sold, sold those online, if you could give us a backstory of that, like how did you know that that, that, that wasn't going to work or, or to move on to the next one? Because sometimes I think, you know, people, they, they come and have an idea, maybe they, you know, get sales, whatnot, and that's a form of validation for them and they keep pursuing. How, how do you know when to, when to like give up or move on to something else or when to stop? Well, um, you brought up the cereal story, which um, <laughs> is one of the craziest moments uh, probably in my life, uh, certainly the Airbnb story, where things were, things were not looking good for us. This is now... Uh, September of 2008, we had been declined by every investor that we reached out to. We'd taken out numerous credit cards that had been maxed out. Uh, nobody was using our service. We were making about $200 a week in fees. That definitely doesn't cover three guys' rent in San Francisco. And this, is, uh, this, this time in a company's history is fondly known as the trough of sorrow. It's where you don't have product market fit. You've gone through the initiation, you get a lot of press and awareness of your new website or service that usually wears off, your traffic comes down and you enter this very flat line of growth, well, it's no growth. Your metrics are pretty flat and it's called the trough of sorrow. And it just simply means you have a product and market and fit's not there yet. So we're, we're deep in the trough and <clears throat> so late one night, Brian and I are trying to keep our spirits high. It's 2 a.m., we're in the kitchen at our apartment. This is the height of the Obama-McCain election in the United States. And we start to joke, wouldn't it be funny if we riffed on the air bed and breakfast side of the name and we actually made a breakfast cereal for our hosts to give the guests. So wouldn't it wouldn't be even funnier if we put Obama's likeness on the box and we called it obama O's, the breakfast of change. And we had a good laugh and, and then we thought, well, we'd have to make one for McCain too. He was an officer in the Navy, so clearly that's Cap McCain's, a maverick in every bite. And we joked about it, and we could picture the boxes and describe the caricatures, their big smiles, and blue box for the Democrats, red box for Republicans. And then we started to actually think, well, how do you make cereal? And I think because our website was failing so miserably, it left us a lot of extra time in our hands to <laughs> imagine and pursue making breakfast cereal. <laughs> and so uh, we ended up figuring out that you could go to the store, you could buy cereal off the shelf, take the bag out of one box and put it in a box of your own design, repackage it and sell it. And so with no money, uh, we found 
a printer who made boxes for us. We designed the boxes, got a caricature artist, beautifully designed boxes, printed at no charge. We cut a deal. We paid commission after every sale and we numbered each one out of 500 on the top. So this was immediately a collector's item, limited edition, Obama O's box. And because it's limited edition, we could charge more than your three, four dollar box of cereal. We could actually charge thirty nine dollars for a box of cereal. And we mailed these out to every press outlet that we could find. You know, Wall Street Journal, Good Morning America, The Today Show, CNN. And we got calls back from just about everybody. And I'll never forget, uh, after these press coverage, we get these orders that would come into the website and we take the money in our PayPal account. I drive down to the grocery store. I buy all the, the honey O's off the shelf, <laughs> truck them back to the apartment, and our kitchen turned into a cereal factory where we were reboxing cereal with a hot glue gun, uh, pulling bags out of boxes and um, boxing up Obama O's and shipping them out. And after we were featured on CNN.com, we sold out of Obama O's. So 500 boxes at $40 a box, we made $20,000 in breakfast cereal and we're able to basically pay off our credit card debt. <laughs> so it got us back to zero, which is better than negative. Uh, but the cereal, uh, funnily enough, was how we were able to uh, help, help keep the runway and the options open for us until eventually the invitation came for Y Combinator. Love that story. How come you didn't, didn't keep producing more cereal boxes though? <laughs> there was a moment where we were actually making more money on selling breakfast cereal than we were from our, our actual core website. And we, I mean, you, you did question, you know, at a moment, you're like, should we pivot? Are we, are we more successful as a politically themed breakfast cereal company than we are as a combinations website? Um, I remember our parents were certainly confused. They thought that, well, what kind of business are you guys actually in? Um, but I think, this comes back to, um, you know, how do you know when to keep going? How do you know when to stop? And for us, um, there were two things that, that were intrinsically motiva motivating us to stick through these really odd, difficult uh, moments. And the first was that we were solving our own problem. This was, this was a solution that helped us pay our own rent. And we believed that there were enough other people out in the world who would also want help to pay their rent and do it in a fun way like, like we, we had come up with. The second thing is we hosted people firsthand and we, we discovered the joy of hosting. We discovered how much fun it was to bring three people into our home, to share meals with them, to share our city with them, taking them around San Francisco to our friends' houses, to house parties, to our favorite establishments, our favorite restaurants and, and sites to see. And you know, at the end of that, that first weekend with our first three guests, you know, we made money, but we also became friends with them um, and still are to this day. And so we could always go back to that experience and say, wait, we believe if enough, if we hold out long enough and if enough people see what we saw and experience what we did, they'll, they'll want to do this. And um, so I think it really came down to that solve our own problem and that firsthand experience that we had. The people who thought we were crazy, they never did it. They, they didn't know firsthand. They were looking at it from the outside. And so we had an insight that they didn't, and that, that's what kept us going. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible. Um, so last kind of ra uh, you know, rapid fire questions just to round things out. We've got about five minutes. I'm conscious of your time, three minutes. Um, I'm just going to shoot them and just answer them in whatever time uh, is, works for you. Um, so what does success mean to you? What does success mean to me? Um, I think success is realizing a dream. I think uh, the, the bonus to that is realizing the dream and then being in a position where you can give it back. And that's been one of the most exciting parts about this journey is um, being able to do things as simple as, as paying it forward by um, talking to early stage entrepreneurs who are seeking advice and looking for guidance and mentorship to things that are more monetary in, in, 
uh, literal giving back, um, you know, being able to do things like um, in San Francisco, I was able to, um, I was able to uh, pair up with uh, Kevin Durant. He used to play on the, the, uh, the, the Warriors in the Bay Area. And uh, we redeveloped a basketball court in, a, in Hayes Valley, San Francisco together. Um, and it was fun to see that improvement on one corner of San Francisco, to see this, this park come to life and kids out there playing basketball. And, and it sparked you know, a bigger idea of, of what are ways to give back in San Francisco that could touch every corner of the city. And um, last year I was able to, to make a gift that touches a topic uh, in the city around homelessness. And I was able to help support two organizations that are making big progress on that topic in the city. Um, so to me, success is realizing a dream, but then also um, being able to, to pay it forward um, once you get there and be able to find opportunities to, to uh, in my case, support entrepreneurs and then uh, uh, give back to communities where it's needed most. Yeah, amazing. That's incredible. Um, look, one last question, conscious of your time. Uh, last question is, what's the one trait that every entrepreneur needs to find success? It's to never take no for an answer. And to actually work the magic of entrepreneurship, which is to turn a rejection into an invitation, an invitation to keep going. We experienced dozens of rejections and we could have given up at any point. And at times I wanted to, at times Brian, like I, all of us at times, uh, there were a lot of, it was easy to quit. Let's just say that it was really easy to stop. But I think entrepreneurship is the ability to turn a rejection into an invitation and you can accept or decline that invitation. The invitation is very simple. Do you want to continue? Okay. That was one person that said, no, well, uh, let's go find a person that says yes. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Well, look, Joe, you've been so uh, generous with your time. That was an absolutely uh, incredible interview. Definitely up there with my top five. I've interviewed a lot of successful founders. So thank you so much. And I'm not just saying that to be nice. That was truly game changing. I know it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you for taking the time. I will let you run. We're over now. But um, yeah, thank you again. Amazing. This was super fun to chat with you. Um, look forward to seeing the piece. And um, yeah, keep up the good work. You're inspiring a lot of entrepreneurs. So uh, I commend you for that. And uh, really applaud you. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.